Need your daily fix on mixed martial arts? We're going to kind of recap Bellator 155. From UFC 198. Who's who? Kind of a controversial decision. And who's not? I couldn't figure out why, and then it hit me. Well, don't you fret, because Golden State Media Concepts got, got you, you covered. covered. Get your daily dose of MMA podcasts. Everything from the UFC, Bellator Fighting Championships, Extreme Cage Fighting, and Victor Fighting Championships, and, and, and so, so much, much more. more. Join us as we talk about some of the big Biggest names in mixed martial arts. We've got you covered here on Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Thank you for tuning into the GSMC MMA Podcast. Brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Arnold DeLeon, hoping that your day is going well. Things are going well here. They're going quite splendid, actually, here in Southern California. Because although people usually dislike the rain here, you think Southern California, sunshine, rainbows, everything's going well. The perfect Southern California weather. It ain't that cold. It ain't that warm. It's just right. Well, guess what? I do love the cold. Uh, Before I lived in Southern California, I used to live in New York. So the whole cold weather. like one One of my favorite places I've ever lived was Denver, Colorado, which is ironic because who would ever say, I love living in Denver? Well, you know what? I actually love living in Denver. Denver was really uh, quite fun for me. Uh, in terms of like, the three places I enjoy living in, it would have to be like Denver, New York, Southern California. I did live in Northern California in the San Francisco area, and it has to be like one of the most like depressing places I've ever been to. San Francisco, which is very ironic, considering the fact that if you go to San Francisco, there's always somebody who's trying to overly hype you up every day. I swear it really does feel like that. If you ever play Grand Theft Auto V, San Francisco is how I see Grand Theft Auto V. It's strange. Or, and vice versa, in the sense that, you know, in Grand Theft Auto V, everyone you see is, like, very on your face, very annoying, and is like, so much marketing is going towards your face, actually, you get, like, overwhelmed by it. Well, that's how it kind of is in the San Francisco area, where everyone's always on your face, there's so many things going around you, and it's not as hectic as it is in L.A., but at least in L.A., there's a culture about it that makes it seem just a lot more enjoyable. San Francisco is like, hey, San Francisco, there's a whole lot of money coming in and out of here, and there's a lot of pressure to succeed here because the Palo Alto area is that if you're not making a quarter of a million dollars, then you're a failure. It's, I don't know, the Palo Alto Silicon Valley area, it's such a difficult area to go live in. And I studied there, like I studied in the Silicon Valley during my time there. There's so much pressure to see there. It is ridiculous. Compared to Los Angeles, Los Angeles, you can be a star coming out of nothing. But in San Francisco, it really does feel like you got to get your act together in order to be successful in that city. That's how it is over there. But you know, that's just me rambling on about the cities we live in. And the reason I'm talking about the cities is because, well, each city and each state is going through a different period right now in covid so I used to live in Northern California in the Stockton area. I lived in I lived in Stockton, and for those of you who are unaware of like the the Stockton lifestyle, the Stockton culture, it's very agricultural. It's very agricultural, like very few buildings in the sense like very like there are like no skyscrapers. Um, it's definitely not a suburbia like a suburbia heaven like it is in San Francisco. It's not even that busy as New York, and it's not even that wild or crazy as Los Angeles. Like, Stockton is its own little isolated world that does, that seem like it's disconnected from everything else. If someone told you that... If someone... If you live, if you live in Stockton, and someone told you that it was the year 2004, like, as, like, somehow you time travel backwards, and you're all of a sudden now in Stockton, and someone told you, by the way, it's 2004... You would believe it because Stockton doesn't. It's Stockton is like one of those places that looks like least industrialized. It doesn't look that loud. It doesn't seem loud. It seems very peaceful. But in the Stockton area, Stockton being next, just an hour away or about forty-seven minutes away from the San Jose area, from the Sacramento area, uh, f- uh, from the from Daly City, everything is just rel- like Northern California, with the exception of, Sil- of the Silicon Valley and San Francisco, is pretty controlled. It's pretty controlled, uh, for those of you who don't remember, dating back to April, and even still going on to now, the, the specific, the agricultural area of Northern California is very clean, in the sense of there's, like, very little COVID cases happening there. Even though there's a lot of people who live outside of the Silicon Valley, outside San Francisco, who live in Sacramento, San Jose, Stockton, 
uh, that there are a lot more older people who live in that in those areas. Or uh, I think it's like Cal State Stanislaus. Yeah, there's a place called Cal State Stanislaus, and a lot of people who go to Cal State Stanislaus are like nephews or grandkids of people who's like grandparents and like old uncles like live there. It's you go to that area for a lot of old people, and strange enough, despite that area being comprised of a whole lot of old people, there's like very few COVID cases happening, uh, very few deaths happening. Our, for for as people like our friends like Nate Diaz and Nick Diaz talk about, you know, Stockton, tough. You know, really, Stockton is a very peaceful place. It's very pe- a lot more peaceful than Los Angeles. I'll tell you that. Uh, a lot more, a lot less hectic than San Francisco. A lot less loud than New York City. So that's Stockton. And so while some cities are doing relatively well for themselves, as in everything is like completely normal, like if you live in Stockton, everything is completely normal there. Now, as it pertains to MMA organizations, there are different MMA organizations that are doing its thing. I think there's a organization called Gladiators MMA. Uh, it's like Gladiators MMA, MMA. It's somewhere in the Midwest. And it's like doing, it's right now pulling out shows. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, wow. So there are still MMA events happening. Not only that, small time MMA organizations are still able to have their events going on. So we have one championship. They're still having their events. Gladiator is having their events. UFC are having their events. Meanwhile, I look this up. We're not going to have another PFL season till sometime in June. Now, once the PFL season goes on, we're going to have a whole lot of MMA happening here. But even then, we're not like there's very little information going towards the new season for the PFL. Like if you look at the like latest news for PFL, the most recent news coming off of their website for for PFL is Kayla Harrison winning a fight in November 22nd. Like that's the biggest news happening for PFL is that Kayla Harrison she won a fight back in November. Right now, it's currently February. As, as I am speaking, it's right now in February. So nothing's really happening there at PFL. Don't expect things happening. And then we have Bellator. And despite Coker and a lot of fighters hyping about, like, Yor Romero, Anthony Johnson, we got fighters signing on to Bellator. We got a lot of new faces going to Bellator. We got we got the promoter talking about Bellator. We got people from other organizations talking about Bellator. Yet, there are no announced dates for Bellator, we were supposed to have a Bellator pay per view event happening on January 1st. And that's not me just saying that or like looking online for like speculations. No, if you look at the official websites for Bellator, they said that they're going to have a Bellator pay per view event happening on January 1st, which is weird because once you look into that proposed card, which by the way was, was on for about for more than a month, like well above a well more than a month, that where if you look at the Bellator site dating back to like December, they said Bellator pay per view event happening in January, 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 and we're right now in February. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. There was no event. There were no announced. There was a match card that had nothing. It's weird. Like you, you go to the Bellator site, you click on uh, Bellator January first events. I forgot the exact numbers. I think it's like Bellator two fifty two. Or 54, and it says there will be an exciting night of action happening on January 1st. And you click on it, and everything is to be announced like fighters to be announced, title fight to be announced, location to be announced. So there was a card that was to be announced, and it was dating back to like December, early December. So I'm not really sure what's going on with Bellator, despite what everyone else talking about it. And also, here's the thing there are no announced dates for Bellator. None. There are no announced dates. PFL, even though their their season is going to start in June, at least they have a date going on. They have PFL has a set schedule happening in the month of June and July. If you go to their main website, Bellator, it's like welcome to Bellator, and then they just say, "Here are our champions. Here are our great fighters. Look at the highlight reel of everything that's happened in the year of 2020." But then there's like nothing happening in the year 2021. No announced dates, no matchups, and every time the MMA community or media members in the world of mixed martial arts, the MMA community, start speculating, oh man, wouldn't it be so cool if we saw Yoro Romero versus you know, Anthony Johnson? What's going on with Lee Mae McFarland? Who is she going to fight next? Will there be a t- what's going on with Chris Cyborg? There's nothing. There's like no news. The only news coming out of Bellator are the fighters themselves announcing fights that they would want to see. Or just like picking fights with other organizations. Like, Ryan Bader 
for the most part, everything he's done since uh, since he was not since not becoming a double champion is like I believe I'm the greatest light heavyweight ever, or I believe that I'm good enough to defeat any light heavyweight or heavyweight in any organization. I think I'm the best here. All right then, but he's not like name dropping anybody specifically from Bellator. He's name dropping other fighters. We have Leon Edwards. Oh, no, no, not Leon Edwards. It's uh Corey Anderson. So, yeah, we have Corey Anderson saying, "Hey." I'm happy here in Bellator, and I'm like, well, how can you say that you're happy there? You just started. You you won one fight in Bellator, and it's weird that you, your Romero, Anthony Romo Johnson, you're all signed, and y- yeah, and you all signed these new contracts, these new guaranteed contracts, but you have no announced like fights happening. I don't get what's going on with the Belter. I don't get it. And whenever someone asks Steve Coker, hey, what do you expect happening this year? He like overly hypes it up. He's like, you know what? Bellator 2021, if you look at the stats here, because there are a lot of like stats out there that do show that if Bellator were to continue having events throughout the rest of the year, they somehow are going to walk away making the most money they ever will in their entire like organization's like lifetime, which I find so weird. Because with COVID happening, I don't know how they're going to get, you know, people coming to the gates. Um, it's hard to promote Bellator in the first place if you're not really having events. You got a lot of fighters. You got people promoting the heck out of Bellator. But you, they're promoting Bellator as an organization, but they're not promoting any events happening in Bellator. The fighters have to do that, but they're promoting, like, hypothetical bouts in the organization. So I didn't go so putting <laughs> That organization's weird. I don't know what the future is for Bellator right now. It's 2021. That organization was supposed to have its best year of its entire organization's like lifespan, but I don't know if that's really the case though. I don't know. You're paying these. You pay. You're paying these fighters, and I don't know if the income you're going to get back uh, returning from those fighters from giving them these big contracts is going to come back and help you guys. I really don't know. So all PLFL, their season's going to start up in the middle of this year. Bellator, we have no clue what to expect from that organization this year. One championship, they're consistently pulling out events, and it doesn't seem like... If you watch one championship, it really doesn't seem like they've been affected by COVID. Because, here's the thing. Here's the thing with uh, what you realize about uh, one championship events. Is that their li- the way how the presentation is for that show is very similar to the Los Angeles Lakers. To a lot of LA Laker uh, games. In a sense that the crowd and the audience... There is no lighting for them. There is very little lighting that happens for the crowd that it does feel like it's an empty arena, but it's not an empty arena because you can hear the crowd. And so you're watching the one championship fights and you're and if someone told you like if the show was on mute and someone told you there's no one in the audience, you would believe it. You would because the lighting is so dim and so dark, and there's such a huge spotlight specifically on like, on, like, on the cage and on the fighters that you just don't see anyone in the audience unless you really focus in with your eyes or there's a crowd shot. But for the most part, it doesn't seem like there's a crowd. And if you go watch at other one events, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the, if you watch other one championship events, the lights are also dimmed. I don't know if like, they weren't as dimmed as they are now, but the lights are so dimmed that you wouldn't even know that there was even crowds being there back in like 2019. With the exception of like some shows, because in some uh, one championship fights, they have like boxing rings. And in those boxing rings, the lights are a lot less dimmed and you can see people in the audience. And that makes the show just feel a lot more better when you go skip, you can go see the audience. But in the current one, in the current one championship events, their events are going on perfectly well. The audience are there. And even if the audience weren't there, the lights are so dim, you wouldn't even notice, like, you wouldn't even see them. And so they're pulling out events day in, day out. Every week they're having, well, one championship events. Or I say every week and a half, two weeks they're having one championship events. They just recently had one championship Unbreakable 2 happening. We just had a recent new champion. We're going to be having an Adamant Grand Prix. Don't know when that's going to happen because the Adamant Grand Prix, it's very weird in the sense that... Initially, it was going to be, we're going to have this tournament to decide who's going to go fight against, you know, like, Angela Lee. And now, we don't know who the fighters are going to be. There's going to be a mystery fighter competing in the Grand Prix. Knowing that there's going to be a mystery fighter in the Grand Prix 
we expect there to be like seven other fighters competing because it's gonna be like an eight person like tournament happening in the Grand Prix. But it's not even solidified on who these who the other seven people are going to be because we just had Mang Bo competing against an unranked fighter. Even though Mang Bo is ranked number two in her division for 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 Angel Lee's title, so what's going on? Like like, what does it take for you to be part of this Grand Prix tournament? Do you have to be a ranked fighter? Do you not have to be a ranked fighter? Do you have to be a ranked fighter? What's going on? One championship right now. Their events they're still going on. They're awesome. I recommend you guys to watch it. But I'm excited to see what will happen for the Adamant Grand Prix coming up in the year of 2021. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast, and today will be a news brief, and I hope you guys enjoy it. So, coming back after a short break here, see you soon. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back, hoping that your day is going splendid. And so, for those of you who don't know, I follow In The Pocket MMA. In The Pocket MMA is a YouTube channel. You can go follow them. And In The Pocket MMA, they have uh, YouTube video content. And also, they do some interesting polls that I found very interesting here. So, they have a poll here. This is from four days ago. Where he, where In The Pocket MMA, they ask, MMA community, let's finally end the debate here. Who is the best boxer in the UFC? And then we have Max Holloway, Dustin Poirier, Conor McGregor, Jorge Masvidal, and Nate Diaz. And let me give you the results here. So 43% of the people said Max Holloway is the best boxer in the UFC. 23% said Dustin Poirier is the best boxer. Number three, we got Conor McGregor. Number four, we got Jorge Masvidal. And then we have Nate Diaz. And I put here Jorge Masvidal. He was my pick. So, Jorge Masvidal had 9%, Nate Diaz had 6%, McGregor 19, Poirier 23, Max Holloway 43. Do I agree with that assessment? Well, I am of the minority opinion here that believed that Volkanovski defeated Max Holloway. I'm in that opinion. Um, the guys over at MMA on points believe that was a rob job. Uh, Big John McCarthy thought that, it was, that Max Holloway got robbed from the decision. Uh, Rogan, Shab, the overwhelming majority of people believe that Volkanovski should have lost the bouts. And for me, I always say, look at the fight stats and look through the eye test. That's how you measure a fight, through both. And if the fight is so close in the eye test, you gotta look at the stats. And the stats say that Volkanovski delivered more strikes then Max Holloway in a per round basis with the exception of one round Holloway landed more strikes and you're going to be like okay so yeah maybe Volkanovski landed more strikes but Holloway landed the more hard looking strikes well guess what they're both landing hard hitting strikes now you can say Holloway was hitting a lot harder alright then but even that's complete, you, it's, it's ridiculous to say oh Holloway got robbed no it was not a rob job it wasn't because the fight stats say that Volkanovski landed more and did more than Holloway in that fight. And if, if, if you're the type of person who's like, you know what, fight stats are overrated, you gotta look at the actual fights. Well, in the actual fights, what I saw were, okay, here's why a lot of people thought Max Holloway won the fight. It's because there were brief instances or there were a short spur of time to which Max Holloway unloaded all these clean shots on Volkanovski. If you were to give me a highlight reel of the fight, 
I'm going to guarantee you the highlight reel will be Holloway hitting better looking strikes on Volkanovski. Max Holloway striking is more of a highlight reel, more entertaining, more pieces to the eye than Volkanovski. Okay, I get that. But if you watch the fight in its entirety and you don't get caught up in the hype, you don't have the commentators influencing you, you're not looking at Twitter and people giving their their opinions being like, Holloway, Holloway, he's the GOAT, yeah. If you look at a fight, you would recognize that there'd be 35 seconds to a minute stretch of Max Holloway unloading these awesome looking strikes, being a clean headhunter towards Volkanovski and winning. 35 seconds to a minute. Alright then. UFC, we're judging a fight in a per round basis. I judge fights based on who and who is winning the totality of the fight. Which means I don't say, oh, fighter A won the fight because he had a better stretch or she had a better stretch. No. Who had a better performance over the span of five minutes? Even if Holly were to get knocked down onto Volkanovski in the final 15 seconds, and then, the, and then the bell saved Volkanovski. Volkanovski, in at the, at the very like, he, like for at the very least three minutes in those five minute fights, in those five minute and five minute rounds, were winning. I mean, he was winning. Give me first round, third round, fourth round. Volkanovski was controlling the fights. He was dictating the, the pace of the fights. And he accumulated more strikes over the course of a five-minute span and did a lot more better than Holloway. Max Holloway, he had a better he had a better run within a minute or two minute span than Volkanovski. But all because he had a better shorter run doesn't mean that you were you were a better fighter. It's because when we think of the Holloway Volkanovski fights, we're not thinking, oh wow, look at all the awesome strikes Volkanovski did. We didn't think of that. We're thinking about Holloway having almost knockdowns on him. And from my memory of the fight, we would have this 45 second span of Holloway landing these good shots. And then Volkanovski for about three and a half minutes doing clean boxing on Max Holloway and picking him apart with these clean shots. But all because Holloway is not being stunned by them doesn't mean they don't count. Alright then? So Volkanovski... I view it, he won the fight. And I think it's ridiculous and it's very disrespectful for in the pocket MMA to do this poll and be like, who is the best boxer in the UFC? And then they don't, they don't put Volkanovski here. They don't do so. Um, I say Hori Mazaval is the best boxer uh, currently right now in the UFC. And the reason for that is because every one of these fighters have been tested. Like, Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker. That was a complete toss-up in my opinion. I thought that fight was the, was the antithesis of a back-and-forth bout between two equally skilled fighters. And either one of them could have won. This Dustin Poirier's cardio was just a little more better than Dan Hooker. So I gave the victory for Poirier in that fight. Poirier ended up defeating Dan Hooker. But I have to say Jorge Masvidal is the best boxer right now. Because the current iteration of, Hor- of Jorge Masvidal, the one that we see right now... He's never really been tested on the stand-up. He hasn't. And I'm, yeah, and you can go look back at old Hori Masvidal videos and be like, Oh man, look at this guy being outstriked. Well, yeah. Hori Masvidal, three, even three and a half years ago, four years ago, is not as good of a fighter as a Hori Masvidal you go see now. It ain't happening. Nate Diaz, the way how I view Nate Diaz, is that he has to be... One of, like, the more overrated boxers, in my opinion. I know, controversial, right? And I'm a guy from Stockton. So how can you say Nate Diaz is overrated? Well, I say Nate Diaz is overrated in the sense that he... Okay, is Nate Diaz really a good boxer? Or does he just have a really good iron chin? Because one thing, one of the things that Nate Diaz can do that nobody else can do, really, except for just Gichi, kind of, is that he can endure so much pain... He can endure so much damage from his opponents while remaining while remaining a consistent pace throughout the fight here that it leaves openings that Nate Diaz can do in his counter strikes that no one else can do. Because when you watch boxing fights or when you see any of these other fighters with McGregor, Poirier, Holloway, Jorge Masvidal, 
they at least have some defensive skills. They bob and weave, they dodge, they parry strikes. Nate Diaz, he eats all these strikes, and upon eating these strikes, because you can counter punch in these moments where the other fighter is attempting a, uh, attempting to throw a punch, yeah, Nate Diaz can pull away with shots that nobody else here can do. Like there's no like it, there's there's nobody in this list right now. Holloway, Poirier, Conor McGregor, Jorge, Jorge Masvidal. There's nobody in this list. Even Volkanovski can do what Nate Diaz can do, and that is pull out these perfectly timed counter punches while being hit at the same time. Because none of these fighters can do that. All these fighters, when they, whenever they pull a counter punch, it's them dodging a hit or how it's supposed to go. You dodge a hit, you avoid a strike, and then you land your own counter strike. Nate Diaz is like he just eats it, and then he just pulls out a counter strike. So I say, is Nate Diaz even that good of a boxer? I'm, I'm not saying that his boxing isn't late level; it's really darn good. But I think from a technical standpoint here, I wouldn't call him the best boxer. And here's the, here's the only thing I'll say: Where are the women in this? Because <laughs> it's ridiculous not to say you want a cheat check, Rose Nami Yunus. Just Gundrad, Zhang Weili, their boxing is incredible. Amanda Nunes' boxing is amazing. And you also have to remember this. All because one fighter can beat another fighter, that doesn't mean that they're better at that certain skill than them. Let's put it out there. If you're saying, okay, the best... Because there's two ways to looking at who the best boxer is. The best boxer is the fighter that can defeat everybody in a boxing match. All right, then, then, in theory, Francis Ngannou and Stipe Miocic are the best boxers in the UFC. Am I wrong to say that? Like, if it was Dyson Poirier versus Francis Ngannou, or Nate Diaz versus Ngannou, or Max Holloway versus Stipe Miocic, I'm not being a hater here saying, oh, man, look at these small guys here. They don't, they don't stand a chance against the heavyweights. No, 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 no. Let's be brutally honest here. Do you think any of the lightweights can compete with the heavyweights. If this poll says who is the best, who is the best boxer in the lightweight division, or is capable of competing at lightweight because Max Holloway isn't a full-time lightweight, who is the best boxer who can compete at lightweight? All right, then you can argue Holloway, Volkanovski, Masvidal, Poirier. Okay, I understand that, but to say that Max Holloway is the best boxer. In terms of he can knock out and defeat everybody in the UFC in a boxing fight? I don't believe so. I don't think that at all. I say even someone like John Jones or Gustafsson would beat them in a pure boxing fight. So that's one way to look at the boxing category. Like who is the best boxer? Another way we can look at the best boxing category is because of technical skills. Or like, who's better at parrying? Who's better at the head movement? Who's better in their footwork? Who's better in their positioning? Who's better in finding that? Who's who's, be- who's the best here in finding the clean counter punches? Then you can say, like, well, Rose Namunis, when everything is clicking, is just the perfect boxer. That's how I view it. I view that from a technical standpoint, in terms of footwork, in terms of head movement, in terms of striking accuracy, in terms of the angling of shots, in terms of dodging, in terms of, like, uh, in terms of like moving away and pairing opponents, I believe Rose Namajunas is the best boxer in the UFC in terms of technical skill. In terms of technical skill, it has to go to uh, to Rose Namajunas. Heck, I was a full priority. <laughs> I fully believe this. I'm getting a lot of flack for saying this, but TJ Dillashaw, you have to make a case for being one of the best boxers out there in the UFC when he was the champion at the time. When he was the bantamweight champion, his footwork was absolutely amazing and stellar. It was great. The guy was trimmed with uh, with Lomachenko for a reason. And when you see his fight against Cody Garbrandt here, it was a complete showcase of how good of a striker TJ Dillashaw was. Yes, he implemented some kickboxing. Yeah, he had, he implemented some kickboxing and like some feints and like he was and he was kind of coaxing out and faking it with takedowns on towards Cody Garbrandt. In that he, we all know that uh, TJ Dillashaw is a great grappler, and he would position his body or make his body look like he would go shooting for a takedown and then he'd go in for a leg kick yes there's that aspect of his fighting style coming towards his direction but in terms of boxing TJ Dillashaw is amazing Cody Garbrand when he's focused and he's not fighting like an idiot and he's actually like 
He's not just being purely a headhunter. His boxing is also stellar. So, if you're saying, who are the best technical boxers in the UFC? You can say T.J. Dillashaw, Cody Garbrandt, Jack Mili, Yohan Aichichek, Amanda Nunez, Rosa Lamienes. Who is the boxer that can defeat everybody in the boxing fights? Derek Lewis. You could say Francis Gadu. You could say Stipe Biocic. I think Max Holloway has to be one of the more entertaining boxers right now in the UFC. He has to be one of the more exciting, most fun boxers to watch in the UFC. And that's because he's competing in a small weight division. And there's no way... There's no way... You can't expect, like, footwork or this much head movement happening in the heavy division. Even at light heavy division, even as athletic and as agile as John Jones is, you don't expect someone like him being able to pull off what these fighters are doing at lightweights or at or at featherweights or even, or even any of the women's strawweights who are competing right now. So, who is the best boxer in the UFC? It is completely subjective. I give you my viewpoint. I give you my opinion on who the best boxer is. I don't think Justin Poirier is one of the best boxers in the UFC. I don't think so. Uh, he, had a, he had a really good fight against Conor McGregor. Good on him for that. Uh, but I believe Justin Poirier, if you're to fight against Jorge Masvidal or Max Holloway, it definitely is an upgrade in terms of the competition, level of competition. So, I would love to see Poirier versus Masvidal. Will it happen? I'm not really sure. But if it does happen, it'd be awesome. One great fighter who developed their boxing is Brian Ortega. And Brian Ortega is going to fight against Alex Volkanovski. And where that fight is going to be the new champion, the new featherweight champion, and compete against Max Holloway, to which I expect another barn burner of a fight. You're listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast. Come back after a short break here. See you soon. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. And we are back. And so this new poll just came up during the commercial break here. Once again, it's coming in from In The Pocket MMA, and I thought it was very interesting. Which of the following current champions is most likely to lose their belts by the end of the year? So for the year of 2020, champions did really well for themselves. Really did. I don't think there were any champions in the year 2020 that sustained a long run and then ended up losing their belts. Because Davis and Figueredo, he won his belt. Uh, Peter Yan, he won his belt. Volkanovski, he defeated Max Holloway early in the year of last year to become champion. Then was able to retain it. We have Izzo Desanya, um, Jan Blakovics, Kamar Usman. Yeah, for the, for the most part here, in terms of holding your belt, you keep it. And I don't see right now any... I, didn't, I don't remember any champion who really struggled all that mightily. In the year of 2020. Other than like Daniel Cormier. Like Daniel Cormier. Maybe. Uh, Volkanovski. Mana Nunes dominated. Stipe Miocic. Uh, he defeated Daniel Cormier to become the champion in the year of 2020. But Daniel Cormier was like. He won, like he defeated Stipe. Then defended the belts <laughs> against uh, Derek Lewis. Then fought against Stipe. So I would I would never call Daniel Cormier's like heavy run all that good relative to the other heavy champions in UFC's history. Because if you're telling me right now, like, who was more dominant in their time 
as the who is more dominant in the heavy division, like Brock Lesnar or Daniel Cormier? You have to say Brock Lesnar, even though you like Daniel Cormier a lot more, a lot more, and it's a lot more respectable. So, other than Cormier, I don't think there was anybody, there's any other champion who struggled in the year of 2020 in terms of defending their belts. Yes, Volkanovski, he defeated Volk- yeah, he defeated Holloway. They had a really close battle against Holloway in the rematch. But other than that, though, there was two champions. There were two. There were two champions who came into the year of 2020, and then weren't able to go and defend their belt successfully. Just two. And so with this pulled up here, who do you think right now would is most likely to lose their belt by the end, end of 2021? We have Davison Figueroa, the men's flyer champion. We have Peter Yan, the men's bantamweight champion. Alexander Volkanovsky, men's feather champion. We have Zhang Weili, women's strawweight. Valentina Shevchenko, women's flyer champion. And the results came in with Davison Figueroa has an 8%. Peter Yan, 19%. 66% of people believe Alexander Volkanovsky is the one most likely to lose his belts by the end of this year. We also have Zhang Weili and Valentina Shevchenko. Uh, Valentinchenko, 2%. Only 2% of people think Valentina is going to lose her belt by the end of this year. And Zhang Weili at 5%, which to me is pretty shocking since I believe the women's strike division has to be one of the best divisions among all the divisions right now in the UFC. Because it is incredibly stacked. And there's a very likelihood that Zhang Weili might lose her belt to even that of Carlos Sparza. That's a real possibility. Uh, but let me look at this right now. So Alexander Volkolovsky... He's voted most likely to lose his belt. Let's look at his challengers. So he'll be facing against Brian Ortega. It'll be him and Brian Ortega. Ortega has looked awesome, by the way. His boxing is at its peak right now. Because Brian Ortega it used to be a thing where if you saw a Brian Ortega match, you expect him to defeat his opponent via to add submission. Via rear naked choke or a triangle choke or an arm bar. Brian Ortega is one of the best jiu-jitsu jiu- jiu- practitioners in the FC right now, I argue right now that he is the best grappler among all fighters right now in the UFC's men's featherweight division. I believe that. I don't think there's anybody right now in the division. We have Brian Ortega. They even look down. You have a whole lot of strikers. We got Calvin Cater, Jeremy Stevens, Dan Iggy, um, Edson Barbosa, Max Holloway, Zabit. Like, there's, a lot of these fighters here are mostly strikers. And when I'm looking at grappling here, we got... So we got Bryce Mitchell and Ryan Hall. And Bryce Mitchell and Ryan Hall, they're ranked number 13 and 14. And by the way, Ryan Hall is finally ranked. <laughs> He's finally ranked right now. Oh my goodness. It took forever for Ryan Hall to be ranked. But Ryan Hall, if the UFC really was pushing on him, was really pushing him, he could be like the Kamza Chimaev of the Feather Division, being this guy who's outside the top 10 whose grappling ability is so good, he can compete with anybody amongst the top five. So he is like the most highest risk opponent anyone would fight. And I think I think a big reason as to why people don't want to fight against Ryan Hall is because of combination A, uh, the UFC are just not calling him for these matchups. And B, a lot of people don't want to fight don't want to fight against Ryan Hall because if you beat Ryan Hall, you don't move up in the rankings. And if you lose to Ryan Hall, which is a high probability of you actually losing to Ryan, then you're going to lose the ranking. So Ryan Hall, Bryce Mitchell are the only two grapplers amongst like primarily focused and grappling fighters in the feather division who can go toe to toe with Brian Ortega in terms of the wrestling, in terms of the grappling, in terms of the jiu-jitsu. Like Ryan Hall, I say right now is just as good, if not arguably better than Brian Ortega in the jiu-jitsu. And Ryan Hall is currently ranked at number fourteen, while Ortega is ranked number two, and he'll be fighting for the title. So, don't expect Brian Tega to fight anybody who is that adept in grappling as good as him. I don't really think so. I don't Because the only fighters who can match Ortega in the grappling are low rank fighters. Everyone else here, from Iggy to Jeremy Stevens to Josh Emmett to Calvin Cater, their grappling are not on par with Ortega and have to be reliant on the striking. So, we have Volkanovski fighting against Ortega. If. Here's the thing. Volkanovski. He's never really been challenged on the ground. He never has. What I'm worried about in his upcoming fight against Brian Tega is I'm worried that Brian Tega might be too confident or he might be... Because we see this all the time. Where grapplers or wrestlers like Ronda Rossi is like the most highest profile fighter who's known, who's known for this. Where you got this fighter here 
who's really great at grappling, who, upon knocking out people, in Briartica's case, Chang Sung Jung, upon knocking out someone, they develop this like weird sense of ego, where, like, oh man, not only am I a grappler, I'm also a top-tier, high-level striker. And, yes, Ronda Rossi, I say, was at one point a top-tier level striker, but she is nowhere near the level of somebody who specializes primarily in the striking. That's why she loses out on Amanda Nunes and Holly Holm and Volkanovski and, and Max Holloway. They're not that bad as grapp- they're, not, they're not that bad at grappling as well. Volkanovski himself is a really good wrestler, but I'm just gonna say now I think Volkanovski's wrestling is not in the same boat or in the same league as Ortega. Now I could be completely wrong here, and we could see Ortega getting taken down by Volkanovski. And then Volkanovski struggling to go for some ground and pound. And we can see Ortega like reversing out. Like Anything can really happen in the world of mixed martial arts. But I'd argue right now that Brian Ortega is more of a challenge. Will be more of a difficult opponent for Volkanovski to defeat. More so than Max Holloway. And then when we look in the and then when we look down in the rankings here. We just have Zabit who nobody has still yet to crack the code on how to defeat Zabit. Except for maybe Calvin Cater. I am definitely in agreement that Alexander Volkanovsky has the toughest route ahead of him compared to every other fighter here other than maybe Zhang Weili. Because looking at the rankings, we got Davis and Figueredo. He's got Brandon Moreno, Joseph Benavidez, Askar Askarov, and Alex Perez. Askarov and Perez, they're definitely going to be... Those are two fighters who are going to come into their fight against Davis and Figueredo as the underdogs. Brandon Roy Val versus Davis and Figueredo. Oh my goodness, that fight could be a fight of the year candidates. Uh, the thing with Davis and Figueredo is the fact that because he is such a complete fighter and he is so skilled rel- compared to everyone else, I legitimately don't see Figueredo losing his belt anytime soon. But I can see him having these like, close like split decision victories coming up. We have Peter Yan versus Aljamain Sterling. That's a really fun matchup. Uh, Peter Yan versus Cody Garbrand. Um, the thing why the reason why it is very difficult to gauge on whether or not how successful Peter will have in his run as the men's bantamweight champion is the fact that I still think he's never really been tested, and we don't have we don't have enough knowledge of him fighting at the highest level yet. Because on his way into becoming the bantamweight contender, of course he fought top level talent, but he never. But as a champion, he now has to fight against top level uh, uh, talent consistently, and he's gonna fight multiple of them. Uh, compared to like you know being unranked and then fighting somebody's like ranked number ten, and then fighting someone who's like ranked number six and becoming a contender, no, uh, Peter Yuan has got a tough road ahead of him, and it's still hard to gauge on how good he will be as champion. And because there's that unknown factor, Peter Yuan, that's I think a reason why a lot of people are still iffy on how good his title reign will be, but they're also like unsure of how dominant he can be as champion. And then we have Zhang Weili here. Zhang Weili, any any one of these women can defeat Zhang Weili. I've been saying it over and over again that the women's strike division is my favorite division because any of these women can defeat her. Any of them can. So, interesting. Zhang Weili is in the same spot as Davidson Figueredo in the sense that she's going to go into almost all of her fights with the exception of her matchup against Carlos Sparza, her potential matchup against her. Zhang Weili is going to go to that fight with the stylistic matchup, like it's in favor of her. There's nobody who's going to go and outperform Zhang Weili. And Zhang Weili is a fighter who, in theory, she should defeat Rose. She should defeat Yuanai Chechek. She should defeat Yan Chunan. She should defeat Michelle Watterson. She should defeat uh, Claudia Cadella. But they'll, these will be close bouts. And just like Davis Figueredo, she's going to have all these like split decision victories. But you still are in favor of Zhang Weili winning most of these fact- bouts here. And then we have Valentina Shashenko. And if Valentina Shashenko... Valentina right now, I think there's another poll came out there where there was joking, like, what is, like, what is the most least stacked division other than the women's fight division? And then the vote came out where it was saying the women's fight division is very flat. Like, nothing is going on there. No one believes in Lauren Murphy. No one believes Kevin Chukagian having another chance against Valentina. Just got draw it, in my opinion, has to be, like, the biggest, like, ray of hope. For Valentina Shenko, and I'm saying and I'm saying that ironically because Jessica Andrade, she herself is a really small girl who packs a punch. I was really high on Cynthia Cavea, really. 
I thought if there's any other fighter here who could have a who could potentially defeat Valentina, it'd be Cynthia. But after uh, after Cynthia's last performance, the stock for Cynthia Cavallo really has dropped. And so just gonna draw versus Valentinchenko, that's the fight that should happen. But they're right now thinking whether it be Lauren Murphy or uh, just gonna draw fighting against Valentina. I think it should be just gonna draw. Um, if Valentina were to defeat just gonna draw, I could easily see her moving up in rankings. I'm mean, moving up in uh, competing at bantamweights. Natural possibility. Uh, people have been saying Valentina should fight against Amanda Nunes again. And, and it's because the current version of Valentina we're seeing right now is a lot more better than the version that fought against Amanda Nunes the first time. So we're going to see a step up in improvements for Valentina. Also, Valentina has improved a lot, just like Amanda Nunes, in her grappling. Because both Nunes and Valentina Shenko were in that position of, okay, these two women are S-tier ranked strikers. Now, what will happen if they fight against somebody who's a grappler? And now we're seeing recently, from their recent performances... That Valentinchenko in her fight against Jennifer Maya and Amanda Nunes against um, Spencer of uh, uh, Flush Spencer, that both these women can now ad- can now adapt and now can use their grappling ability. Yes, their grappling ability isn't you know the absolute best in the world, but it's good enough to go get them the victories. And since they're so physically more a lot more dominant than whoever they're matched up with in their respective division, they're making up their lack of technical ability in the grappling with their stri- with their sheer strength and power. So Valentina, I think she's safe. Zhang Weili, she's got a lot of tough matchups ahead of her, but just like Davis and Figueredo, they're both going to pull out these amazing fight of the night performances, and they're going to come in as the favorites, and they're probably going to win their close matchups. Peter Yan, he's too much of a wild card for you to really gauge on how good he will be as champion. And Alexander Volkanovsky, there are a lot of people who still believe Max Holloway should be the champion, I don't think so, but Brian Ortega versus Alexander Volkanovsky, which is a matchup that's going to happen in the month of March, like early to mid-March is when they're expected to fight each other. It's not going to be in Fire Island. It's going to go and be at the UFC Apex Facility building. That's going to be a real showcase of how good Volkanovsky um, is as a grappler. He will really be tested there. I don't think uh, this will be the toughest matchup for Volkanovsky in terms of the grappling. But after this, though, we might... Excuse me. One matchup I do want to see in the men's feather division that a lot of people are not talking about. Zabit versus Max Holloway. Yes, Max Holloway had a stellar performance. Absolutely amazing performance against Calvin Cater. Great. Like, like viral-worthy performance. But Zabit, um, he came into the year 2020 with a whole lot of hype. If COVID didn't happen, we could have seen Zabit fight for the title. But Zabit been, uh, was inactive. Like, Zabit's been inactive for the entire year of 2020 after coming into the year being like, okay, this guy, bona fide future world champion. So depending on what happens with Zabit, we could see Max Holloway versus Zabit and winner of that bout will fight against Volkanovski. But if Zabit is unavailable, then we can see Volkanovski versus Max Holloway again for the third time. And so you're listening to the GSMC MMA podcast. And coming back with a short break here will be the news brief portion of the podcast. So stay tuned. Want to know the latest in soccer? Then listen to the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. From MLS, the World Cup, and the Premier League. We've got you covered. The latest updates, the hottest matches, and news on the league's top players. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Soccer Podcast. David Beckham scores the goal to take England all the way to the World Cup Finals. Listen now. Welcome back to the GSMC MMA Podcast. So let's go into the news brief portion of the podcast here. First off, we have coming up Saturday, February 6th, 5 p.m. at the UFC Apex Facility Building, which you can watch on ESPN+. Plus. Let's hope that ESPN Plus is going to work. Things go all bueno for the West Coast because last time people weren't able to go watch a show. Hopefully ESPN Plus works this time. So it'll be coming up uh, Saturday, February 6th, 5 p.m. UFC Fight Night. It's Overeem versus Volkov. Main event, Alistair Overeem versus Alexander Volkov at the heavyweight division. We have Corey Sanhagen versus Frankie Edgar being the co-main event at Bantamweight. Marin Murnau versus Macy Chasim in the women's Bantamweight division. Alexa- uh, uh, Alexandre Patoa versus Manuel uh, Kepe 
Cody Stammen versus Andre Ewell. And then we have, in the lightweight, we have got Carlos Diego Ferreira versus Benelli Darius. So it's a night full of prospects and um, changes in the rankings here. Alistair Overeem is that fighter who I believe is maybe two fights away. He's two fights away from potentially competing for the title. Uh, Corey Sanhagen versus uh, Frankie Edgar. That is a complete toss-up. Frank Edgar has looked awesome. Victoria Sanhagen, I think, though all the momentum and all stuff is currently going towards his direction. Um, Carlos de Gaffera versus Benelli Darius. Benelli Darius, if you have not caught up with him, he's a prospect you definitely should watch out for. And within the span of two years, man, this guy can compete amongst, I say, like the top seven of the UFC's lightweight division. So that's something you got to keep up for. The next major UFC pay-per-view event will be coming up on Saturday, this February 13th, with the main event being Kumar Usman versus Gilbert Burns. Co-main event, Uriah Hall versus Chris Weidman. This is a huge, this is a must-must win for both Hall and Chris Weidman because uh, Weidman and Uriah Hall, especially in the past year and a half, two years, they've tumbled down in terms of their stock. Uh, Chris Weidman, former world champion, he then like started going through a series of losses. Uriah Hall, the upsetting thing about Uriah Hall is that it's impossible to not talk about this guy and be like, whoa, this dude has so much potential. But that's all he became, potential. In his fight against Anderson Silva, the build-up and the promotion for the fight was Uriah Hall versus Anderson Silva, the guy who's supposed to be as good as Silva in his prime, but became an underachiever versus this guy who is just out of his prime. So there's a lot of negativity going towards the direction of Uriah Hall and Chris Weidman. So both these fighters desperately need this win. And Dustin Poirier, he's been popping a lot lately in my recommended feed. Uh, people are finally giving the respect for uh, Dustin Poirier, and I'm happy about it. But one fighter that I'm very interested in, into seeing where their replacement is in the UFC's lightweight rankings has to be Charles Oliveira. So this is coming in from SportsSkeeda.com. Main headline being Charles Oliveira turned down a massive fight at UFC 258 for no wait, for one reason. This is being written in by Sumik Data, top UFC lightweight contender Charles Oliveira, has report, was reportedly offered a huge fight against Michael Chandler at the upcoming UFC 258 pay-per-view event. Our report from AG Fight has claimed that Du Bronx was in the was in contention of facing the former Beltran Lightweight Champion in Las Vegas, Nevada later this month. However, the same report also claims that Charles Oliveira rejected the offer, as the soon to be vacant UFC Lightweight title would not be on the line for a fight against Chandler. So Charles, so Charles Oliveira, he said, so practically he's saying, I don't want to fight against Chandler because it's not for the title. And Poirier and McGregor talked about this, how they believe their fight should have been for the title. And Charles Oliveira, the way how I perceive him right now, it's a case of Oliveira, he does not want to fight against Michael Chandler. He wants to fight immediately straight for the title. And Michael Chandler is one of those fighters who is in that very strange position where it is easy to argue as to why he shouldn't compete for the title. And it's also easy to argue as to why he should compete for the title, especially after his one-punch knockout on Dan Hooker. So for Oliveira, the way how I perceive it and the way how I think he's perceiving it, it's like if he fights Michael Chandler, it's it's kind of a step down. If you offered Oliveira a fight against Justin Gaethje, fight against his Poirier, he would definitely say yes to that fight. Michael Chandler, he is an unranked fighter who fought against the number six ranked guy. And although there's no official ranking on him yet, he is definitely in the talks or in the discussion of competing for the title. So, Oliveira, Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler, this and Poirier, they're all in discussion right now as to, okay, who's going to compete for the title? Is Khabib retired? Is he not retired? I believe Khabib retired. I think uh, Dana White's the only person who's trying adamantly really hard to go and say, hey man, Khabib, he's still active, technically. So, Oliveira, he wants to fight against Poirier. I think that's a great matchup. Michael Chandler, he's up to fight against anybody because he's unranked. So, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Joe Rogan, this is via MMAMania.com. Joe Rogan picks Michael Chandler to beat Conor McGregor. Uh, and <laughs> this is a perfect time to euthanize the UFC cash cow. I am very speculative as it pertains to... I'm, I'm very speculative as it pertains to Conor McGregor because no one knows... What goes on in this guy's head? No one knows. I would love to see Conor McGregor versus Chandler. I would love to see him Conor McGregor versus Tony Ferguson. That'd be a fun matchup. Uh, Conor McGregor Nate Diaz three is a fight that everyone wants to see. 
But is it going to happen? I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, this guy, he's got... He says he wants to be a lot more active. But I don't know what he means by that. Because he says he wants to be more active. Now, does he want to be more active in the UFC? Does he just, in the general sense, want to be active? I don't know. Does he want to compete against Manny Pacquiao? That offer still on the table. So, we're unsure of the future for Conor McGregor. Uh, he just had a devastating loss from the Poirier. He looks really happy. I had a discussion about this with one of my friends where he says, Oh man, Conor McGregor, he is the worst. He threw the, like, he threw a chair on the bus, man. He attacked the bus. This guy is the absolute worst. But then you look at Conor McGregor now and how he talks, how he presents himself, even the promotional buildup, the way how he handled the fight against the Poirier. Complete night and day. The guy is a proper professional. And I respect that. There's a whole lot of professionalism between the Poirier and Conor McGregor. And because we're seeing this very different side of Conor McGregor, if this was like Conor McGregor from like 2016, 2017, he'd be like, yeah, I'm willing to fight anybody. I'm willing to fight for the money. Well, guess what? Conor McGregor, he made the money. All right. The guy made a whole boatload of money. He plans to go compete against Manny Pacquiao. Will he fight, for, will he fight against Logan Paul and Jake Paul? I hope that doesn't happen. I really don't. But that's also open to even happening. That's the thing that can be a real possibility. So whenever there's speculation going on with Conor McGregor, I do not want to... I don't want to place my bets on anything right now. Uh, whatever happens to him, happens. Uh, do I want to see him fight again this year? Yes. Uh, although the Conor McGregor we're seeing right now, will he be champion? I don't know. If, I don't know if he's good enough to be champion. But what I do know is that Conor McGregor is a major box office draw. And because he's such a charismatic figure, and he's such a polarizing figure in the world of mixed martial arts, in combat sports, and in general sports, you want to see this guy compete, win or loss. Uh, so, Conor McGregor, whatever happens in his future, I don't know. But I'm excited for whatever does come to line, whether it be him fighting against Manny Pacquiao, or him fighting against Michael Chandler. Whatever happens, happens. And so, Dan Hooker, the speculation going on on retirement rumors... So I'm reading this right now from Sherdaw.com. The main headline being, uh, Dan Hooker clears up retirement rumors following UFC 27 knockout loss. It is being written in by Tristan Critchfield. So he goes on to say that, You're always frustrated after a loss. This is coming in from a transcription he had with MMAfight.com. It was a balance of everything, sheer frustration, disappointment, and in the moment, I was like, I'm done. I'm finished with this, uh, with the sports, I'm done. Then you get back to the hotel and you think about it, and you realize you're not... You're not good at anything also either. So it's like, well, I've kind of pinned myself into a bit of a corner here. People think you're going to be rolling around the depression and not getting out of bed. But I know what it is. This is a sport I've been doing and following my entire adult life. It's always as it's always a possibility. A loss like this. You're not rolling around depression, super upset. It's self-explanatory. It is what it is. I can honestly say I'm not, I'm not any more upset than when I lost to Poirier in this fight. Hooker was on a defensive was on the defensive throughout the fight. He lost to a surprising he lost to a surprising uh, victory in favor of Michael Chandler. I did not think that fight was going to go the way it did. I thought Chandler versus versus Dan Hooker was going to be a fight that would go on for three rounds of action, with Chandler trying to go shoot him for a takedown and Dan Hooker poking him with striking. But that didn't happen. So Michael Chandler pulling up the upset. Here's the thing: even Michael Chandler he came into that fight as the underdog. He came to have as the underdog. Majority of people thought Dan Hooker would win that bout. So it's very upsetting to see how the results, what the fight result actually uh, was. He continues saying that, to be honest, I have nothing to say. Like a week went past, and what can you say? What can you say? You have your good days, you have your your bad days. You go into these kind of things and prepare yourself for the worst case scenarios. But even that took the cake. Even though it was a surprise to me how bad it went... This was very surpri- This was very surprising. So I was like, okay, what can you say? I have no words to describe it. You come to and you're just like, I've wasted four months of my life for that. As far as analyzing his performance, Hooker chalks up the KO loss is simply not reacting properly to Chandler's attacks. He goes on to say, that's like the funny thing. Zigged and should have zagged. That's all it is. Fighting is like a mixture of thinking and your reactions. You're balancing your processing your thought of your reactions and actions. I felt like I was calm, could see everything, was thinking, was sharp in there. I just relied on my reactions to get out of the way of that punch and let me down. It's hard to describe. It's such an obvious error and such a very costly mistake. So, Dan Hooker in his performance... Yeah, honestly, I'm surprised at Dan Hooker's performance. I've seen him fight better. 
I have seen him react a lot more faster. I've seen him become a lot more aggro. The way that Dan Hooker fights in his fight in his bout against Michael Chandler was so strange. Usually, for every Dan Hooker fight, he always just goes in there blitzing, but he fought very defensively against Michael Chandler. And I'm thinking about it, and I'm like, wow, I think if Dan Hooker was given another opportunity to fight against Michael Chandler again, then, you know what, maybe I believe that Dan Hooker would have had a much more better performance, and heck, possibly, he could have defeated Michael Chandler if they were to fight in a rematch. I really believe Dan Hooker is that talented. I think he has that much of a fight IQ, but things just didn't go his way. I think he overthought things, and he came to the fight with the wrong strategy. So, but with the refocus mind, we could see a better version of Dan Hooker going towards the future. And so the following report is coming in from MMAJunkie.USAToday.com. Champ Kamaru Usman explains why that chip is still very on my shoulder ahead of UFC 258. So this is coming in from John Morgan. At this point in his career, Kamaru Usman has clearly established himself as one of the top fighters in the world. He goes on to say in a recent interview that it's funny actually, I've still got that chip on my shoulder uh, this coming in from a recent interview he did with MMA Junkie. It's actually almost even bigger now. And it's because with all that, for some reason, people still don't want to give you the respect you deserve because of maybe their personal preference, but it is what it is. He goes on to say, That chip is still my shoulder because when I got into this, it wasn't for legacy, it wasn't for fame or money or anything of that nature. It was just simply to compete and prove that I am the best, that I can be the best at my time. And so that was my mindset, and it's still my mindset. That's the biggest thing that drives me is competition. So as long as there's competition out there, and as long as I am, and I, he says, as long as I am, and that's the biggest thing, I have to be honest with myself. As long as I'm honest with myself, and I'm still capable of doing it, I want to be the best, so that chip is still heavy on my shoulder. He said his mind is better, he is ready to dictate himself, he's doing his homework. So Kumar Usman, he has to be one of like, the smartest, most calculating fighters out there currently in the world of mixed martial arts. So a reason why a lot of people can't get into the hype of Kumar Usman, a lot of hardcore MMA fans can be like, Kumar Usman, one of the best fighters out there, in the recent poll I read up. Kumar Usman has to be up there, as in he's one of the fighters who is least likely to lose his belt. Because when you look at his rankings in the welterweight division... Other than Gilbert Burns, who else can be a potential real threat for Kumar Usman? Who could be a real potential threat right now in the current top 10 rankings who can go and defeat Kumar Usman? And you really can't think of anybody. You really can't. You got the Wonder Boy Stephen Thompson's out there. You got Gilbert Burns, Tyron Woodley, Kobe Covington. But in the way how I view it right now, there is nobody who perfectly matches up with Kumar Usman. Other than Gilbert Burns. I think Gilbert Burns is a better striker. Both fighters are going to endure the biggest test of their careers in terms of the grappling. Kumar Usman has never fought anybody who is as good of a grappler as Gilbert Burns. Gilbert Burns, who normally who came who came to the UFC as a jiu-jitsu grappler, became a striker, and we're gonna see, okay, can Gilbert Burns still tap out people? Despite this move in a different weight class and him being used to striking people. How good of a grappler is Gilbert Burns? Is Kumar Usman's wrestling better than Burns Jiu-Jitsu? We're going to see. We're going to see who the better all-around MMA fighter is. And that's why I'm excited for the Gilbert Burns versus Kumar Usman matchup. We're going to see two fighters who are going to showcase their complete mixed martial arts skills against one another. And so that will bring us to a close for today's podcast. You have been an awesome audience. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to the GSMC MMA Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask you, please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review. That really helps us. Also, you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you, and have a good night. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts MMA Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.